I'm Kat. I'm coming in live from Brooklyn, New York. I work for Wild Alaskan Company as part of the recipe team. So today's event is all about easy ways to eat more seafood. Um, there are many things that I have personally found that make it really easy to enjoy seafood on a regular basis. We'll start um, by breaking it down into three different parts. Number one, thawing. So I'm going to show you how to thaw fish really easily. There's two different methods that um, are, I guess, like my go-tos that'll help you cook any species of fish anytime. Um, part two, I'll go into some of my favorite tools and um, cooking essentials, like even ingredients that make any species very easy and very delicious um, to, to prepare. And then part three, we'll do a little cooking demo. All right, let's start with thawing. This is step number one for when you're cooking with frozen seafood. Um, but we're going to start with what is the first way that I defrosted fish. And it's it's sort of like the overnight method or um, what I used to consider the ideal method because it's very hands-off and keeps the fish like really, really nice. So I'm going to grab some fish from the freezer. So we have a filet of halibut. And the first thing I'm going to do to defrost it is take it out of the packaging. So it's going to come out of the vacuum seal. And I don't know if you can see really well, but there's like a thick layer of ice on it. That is not um, freezer burn. That's an ice glaze that's applied to the fish after it's frozen. It's basically an extra layer of armor so that the fish stays really, really nice and fresh, even as it sits in your freezer. Um, you know, because things over time do change. It's still going to be good to eat no matter how long it's in your freezer, if it's frozen properly, but um, this will keep it in peak quality for at least a few months. So to defrost it overnight, all I'm going to do is grab a plate and put it on there. And then I'm going to put this in the fridge. Um, ideally, you're putting it on a low shelf. What you would do is just leave it overnight on a bottom shelf just to make sure that if any of this ice glaze melts off, it's not going all over everything in the fridge. Using a rimmed plate is good. You can use a rimmed baking sheet. And then within 10 to 12 hours, it probably will be defrosted. Now, this is a super chunky piece of fish, so it's possible that it might need more time um, in my fridge, especially if the refrigerator is super cold. So, um, you know, every refrigerator is different depending on how you have it set, depending on how many things are in there or how often you're even opening and closing the door. Um, that's all there is to it uh, when you're defrosting overnight. That's what I used to do. But now <laughs> I use the quick thaw method. That is my go-to method for defrosting fish and is has become my ideal because it's much more convenient um, if you're cooking on a whim. And I often cook on a whim. So um same thing, you would take it, you need to take it out of the vacuum sealed packaging just as a matter of food safety. And also because there's an ice glaze on this, if you have it in a vacuum sealed pack, the ice glaze is going to melt off and basically just be stuck onto the fish. And that's actually going to make it really hard or a little more difficult to sear, broil, get a really nice crust. So that is my main reason for taking it out of the packaging. And it seems redundant, but you're going to put it back into something that's a resealable water food pack. To do a quick thaw, you're just going to drop it into a bowl of cold tap water, um, not hot water, not warm water. You just want cold water. Um, because the fish is going to float, you want to try to get it it's submerged. And all you have to do is let's take my coffee cup from earlier today. <laughs> You just want to be putting a weight on top of it. With this, like I said, it's a thicker piece. It'll probably take about an hour. This is totally my go-to method um, because I usually have about an hour's notice for cooking something. And an hour's notice might just mean that I'm getting hungry and I know I want to eat something in about an hour. I am going to move on to part two of this, which is all about my essentials for cooking seafood. The tool that I recommend if you're very new to cooking wild-caught seafood 
is the Wild Alaskan Company How-To Cooking Guides. So we have cook times, cook temperatures, and techniques that are tailored to the species of fish that we're using. These are absolutely essential when you're new to cooking wild-caught fish, even if you think you know how to cook seafood. It's worth looking at these to understand what the cook times and temperatures are for each species. I also have a few essential tools that have really been my, um, I guess, sort of like my arsenal in the kitchen. And the first one I want to talk about, I kind of talked about this a little bit. I usually have a big stack of clean kitchen towels. I've got more here. Just a huge stack of these. I use these instead of paper towels when um, I'm patting fish dry, where I'm defrosting it on the towel overnight, like I showed you earlier, or when I'm preparing fish to go into a pan. And this is going to be a complete game changer for you if you are struggling to get fish to be like the perfect texture, the perfect golden crisp. Do not skip it if you ever see a recipe on the blog that says to pat the fish dry, you must do it. The other one that feels more like a real tool is a fish spatula. So the fish spatula is a really flexible, thin metal spatula. The benefit of this is the shape and thinness. It's going to make it so easy to flip fish, to get under any size of filet without breaking the fish, especially if it's super flaky. Um, it's also because it's so thin, you're, if you're ever trying to get a fish from not sticking to the bottom of the pan, um, depending on how you're cooking it, this will just give you a little bit of an extra, like almost like slice through so that you can flip very easily. But another tool that I um, don't use as much anymore, but I probably would use it to um, check the temperature of that really thick fillet of halibut is an instant read thermometer. So the instant read thermometer is going to be very different than like a turkey thermometer that your grandma used to use because it reads the temperature of um, a fish very, very quickly, just within milliseconds. So this is really good for gauging the doneness of fish. And that's why I would use it on something like a thick fillet of halibut, because you're going to try to get this probe into the center of the fillet, the thickest part, to understand if it's cooked to um, the doneness that you're looking for. These are pretty easy to use. You just need to be able to know that it's in the center of the fillet. Um, and it'll really help you understand what fish looks like when it's medium rare or when it's medium. And it'll also help you develop your own palate for, you know, when do you know if you like medium rare or not? Like now you'll be able to tell like, oh, I don't like fish when it's 125. I like fish when it's 130. And then you can use this to help kind of guide your palate. The other tool that I have that I'm not using today, well, I am actually, but I really like having parchment paper on hand, not only for um, making cleanup really easy if you're baking things, but also as a packet for fish. I oftentimes will um, use this as my cooking demonstration for this particular event where I'll build a whole meal inside of this packet, fold it up, pop it in the oven, and then voila, after about 10 minutes, we'll have a really nice steamy, delicious meal that we can open up and serve. And it's almost a foolproof way of cooking fish. The other tools that I want to talk about are actually edible tools. So um, I have a few ingredients that I really rely on when I'm cooking seafood. I'll start first with panko breadcrumbs. So panko breadcrumbs is where or is something that I use when I'm creating a crust on fish. I use these to help bind something like fish cakes together. They're really um, like a thicker breadcrumb than something like a traditional breadcrumb. So I don't know if you can hear that crunch, but they're super crunchy, add so much texture and dynamic, dynamic texture to any meal. Another thing that I really like is pesto. In the summertime, we'll make pesto sometimes, but it's a whole production. Having something that's a store-bought delicious option is going to make it so much easier for you to cook seafood um, anytime. You kind of don't have as many excuses. You can throw fish into a pan and then serve this afterward with just like a little swipe of sauce. You can bake fish with pesto, which is what we're going to do later. You can toss pasta in it if you're making pasta. 
and um, just have a really delicious, like almost instantly flavored seafood meal. So that's one of my favorites. Um, the other ingredient that I want to share today is um, Dijon mustard. So mustard is great with seafood. It's just a really nice complement to salmon, like any kind of white fish, really good for creating marinades, sauces, dressings. Uh, something about it is just a very nice balance to the delicate flavors of seafood or even the more robust flavors of seafood. The next time you are cooking something, even just baking a filet of fish with a little bit of olive oil whisked together with mustard, maybe some garlic in there, is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal like upgrade in flavor, much better than just garlic and olive oil. Add a screen of Dijon in there and it's going to be super tasty. The final thing I just want to reiterate as a tool is the member experience team. If you ever have any questions about how to cook something, you want some recipe recommendations, you need to like troubleshoot, um, you know, what's happening with your oven, not, you know, they're not going to repair your oven, but they might be able to help you dial in the temperature for any species of fish. Feel free to reach out to them. They are amazing. Um, so let's do this cooking demo. This is a really fun one. What I'm going to make is pesto baked salmon with crunchy breadcrumbs. And we're not gonna do any chopping and we're not gonna do any measuring. What I'm gonna use today though is this beautiful filet of sockeye. We're gonna start by using um, a parchment lined baking sheet. You don't have to use parchment in this case, but you're gonna judge me if you see what my baking sheet looks like. It's got many, many uh, meals of baked on goodness on there. So, um, the parchment there to cover it up. <laughs> so first thing I'm going to do is drizzle it with olive oil to make sure that it's not sticking to anything. Step number two is we're going to take some of this pesto that I had here on the counter and spoon that right on top of the fish. I didn't actually season the fish because this uh, sauce in itself is pretty tasty. Next thing I'm going to do is put some breadcrumbs on top. And this is just going to be for an extra dose of texture. So that is no measuring. I'm just going to do a little extra drizzle of olive oil right on top to get that breadcrumb crust to ensure that it gets toasty. And then this is going to go into the oven for, we're going to start with six minutes, I think. This is actually a pretty hefty filet of sockeye. So I'm going to check, I might need to cook it for a little bit longer than that, but let me just drop this into the oven right now. All I said drop it into the oven. Don't drop things into the oven. We're just going to slide it into the oven. Um, so that's going to cook for about six minutes to start. Um, the oven is at 375 degrees. Salmon is not going to be done in six minutes at that thickness but we're basically gonna cook it part of the way to being fully cooked. And then after that, we're gonna broil the fish so that all that breadcrumb right on top, that's gonna get really nice and browned. The reason I really like this method and I think it works so well is that there's already so much flavor in the pesto. You don't have to use um, a green pesto. You can use something like a sun-dried tomato pesto, anything that's a little bit saucy like that, there's probably already garlic in it. So that's a bonus for me. And um, there's also plenty of oil, olive oil in there, hopefully, um, if you're buying something that's like a good quality pesto, that'll help keep the protein in the fish super, super moist. Um, it kind of protects it from the heat. It gives it a little extra fat so that the fish um, doesn't cook and end up becoming really dry as it's cooking. The fish right now, we're getting some browning on top with the breadcrumbs, which is great, but they look a little pale, which is why we're gonna broil it in a little bit. But let me see what the temperature is. So it is still pretty underdone right now. It's about 68 degrees in the center. So this needs to cook probably for another minute or two before I move it to the broiler. All right, this is looking pretty good right now. So this is probably ready to go under the broiler. I'm just going to check the temperature to see what the center is. 
Um, yeah, so we're at about a hundred, let me do it from this side, about a hundred degrees in the center of the fillet, more or less. So this is like very, very rare at this point, but kind of cooked. So this is the moment where I like to put the fish under the broiler and we're just going to let it cook for another minute or two, keeping a very close eye on the breadcrumbs because we don't want those to burn. So I'm going to take the fish off, off the parchment because this is totally going to burn in, under a broiler. You can use aluminum foil rather than parchment and keep your pan nice and clean while not setting fire to anything. All right, so now that this is under the broiler, we are going to stay very close to the oven. I'm gonna keep an eye on the fish so that it gets nice and browned on top. I hear sizzling and sizzling is a great thing. Burning is not, so let me just take a peek here. All right, this looks perfect. All right, you're gonna see a really delicious, almost slightly burnt actually, dare I say. We can just scrape a little bit of that first layer. There, perfect now. <laughs> I'm gonna move this to a plate so you can see a little bit better. And we have pesto big salmon in a very crispy crust. But moment of truth is if you can flake it really easily with a fork and that piece came off just like that, super easy. It's a little bit like a translucent, translucent like jewel tone in, in the center here. And that's like the medium rare doneness that I really, really like. So let me take a bite. Perfect. And even if I wanna destroy this piece of fish. I'll show you what the center looks like. So the center of this fish to me is a perfect medium red doneness. If you want something that's a little more medium, absolutely do that. It's gonna be a little bit drier in texture, but still should be flakeable. And this is like, for me, like peak, peak texture. But um, if it's medium, it's gonna be a little less translucent, probably like a fully pink. Um, fully light pink fillet, but this to me is perfect. So that is it for today. Um, next week, I'm not going to be here, but we'll have another one of my colleagues hosting an event um, that we're we're really excited about. We're going to be making a Pacific cod curry rubbed sandwich. Um, until then, um, hopefully we'll see you. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Uh, until I see you then, live wild, everyone. Bye.